So, uh, Act 2. We finally meet Morose, and uh, uh, if you take a look at Act 2, you might notice that uh, unusual when compared to the plays of Shakespeare, uh, the stage directions are a pretty big deal. Morose uh, has a conversation, if you will, with a character who's listed as the Mute, and um, Morose is described as carrying a tube in his hand, which is like, you know, one of those old old horns that old people put in their ears in cartoons and they go, Hey, Sonny, what's that? Anyway, a speaking tube. Um, uh, and uh, the mute character is described as making a leg every, every so often. I guess you can't see from the camera angle, but making a leg is, you know, a gesture like this where you stick your leg out in front of you and uh, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of bowing uh, uh, that shows your obeisance to, to your master. So the mute character is frequently described in the stage directions as making a leg to agree to Morose. And, you know, suppose us, we're probably also supposed to think of Morose as being rather silly for having a servant, instead of just nodding, giving him this huge uh, gesture in order to agree with him. Uh, there's a reference in Act 2 early on to a horn being winded. Uh, we might just say, to, you would, we would say we blow a horn rather, rather than wind a horn, same thing. Uh, but anyway, the horn blows, and remember Truitt had just in the previous scene announced someone's got to stop this wedding, and his, his friends say, eh, I don't really want to do that. Well, Truitt shows up uh, pretending to be a messenger from the king and actually carrying a noose. It's described as a halter in the, the, the uh, script, but um, uh, it's a noose. And uh, uh, he makes a very visual pun on the idea of tying a knot. Uh, he says, if you tie a knot, you should, you, this, you should be... This is the knot you should tie. It's a message that um, uh, Truitt uh, doesn't present himself as Truitt, but he just says he's the messenger from the king, passing on the message that Morose's friends are warning him not to marry. And we know that Truitt is doing this because uh, he wants to stop Morose from the marriage that will disinherit his friend Dauphine. But... Um, uh, on the pretext that Truitt is just trying to scare Morose, that really leads into a, some really long and some detailed and kind of cynical, satirical speeches about how awful marriage is. And, uh, you know, Johnson was married, but uh, uh, the, 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 the humor here is that in otherwise conventional society, there's a long, drawn-out speech about how awful marriage is. All right. So, um... Uh, uh, there's some good comic touches. Truitt finishes his big, his big performance, and he says he's going to leave this noose here for remembrance. And as he exits, he stops, and he uh, uh, formally says to the mute, farewell, mute, and then leaves. And I'm sure the audience would applaud, because it would have been a great performance. And just when um, Morose thinks the ordeal is over and starts to recover and starts bringing up another topic for conversation... Off stage, Truitt blows the horn again. Um, just a bit of, of extra comic timing that would give the actors some, some something fun to react to. Um, okay, Act Two, Scene Two takes place in John Daw's house, and uh, uh, Daw is trying to encourage Epicene to come with him to this party he was talking about, and uh, Daw's frustrated because Epicene doesn't seem to want to go to the party. Now. Uh, out loud, Dauphine and Claremont, they agree with him that Epicene should go to the party. But it's a, uh, here we notice something a little strange. In a lower voice, Dauphine and Claremont both tell Epicene, uh, uh, don't go to the party. She's only being invited so that the ladies of that college can laugh at how meek and quiet Epicene is. And at one point, Claremont says to Epicene, he will suspect us, talk aloud. Uh, but anyway, Johnson is cluing the audience in on the fact that Claremont, Dauphine, and Epicene are up to something that John Daw doesn't know about. And at this point in the story, we don't know about it either. Uh, so we still don't know exactly what's going on, but Daw reads some poetry in praise of Epicene, and uh, Dauphine and Claremont are kind of flattering John Daw. They say it sounds like Seneca or Plutarch. They're mentioning uh, famous poets. And Daw huffs, and he says, oh, those guys, they suck. My poetry is much better than them. And he launches into, uh, a, a, he's churning out a long list of all these classical 
authors that John Daw is criticizing, saying he's much better than all these classic, classical authors. I think this would have amused the educated audience who would likely know these classical figures uh, as well as you and I know superheroes. Anyway, while John Daw and Epicene are occupied off to one side, a true wit arrives. Um, uh, and by the way, this is the, the third time I mentioned Truitt makes a dramatic entrance. You'd have an actor who would make that entrance a, a big thing, a funny thing. Anyway, Truitt arrives proudly telling Dauphine and Claremont the wedding is off. And we have the first of several plot twists. Uh, instead of being pleased, Dauphine is actually annoyed. It turns out uh, he and Claremont already had a plan of their own and that Epicene was in on it. And by, uh, uh, by getting Morose to call off the wedding, Truitt has screwed up their plans. Um, so we learn just a little bit about what's going on, and uh, the next plot twist happens, you know, just minutes later, when Cupbeard arrives. This is the butler, the butler, the barber, who had found uh, Epicene for uh, Morose. A uh, cupbeard arrives with, well, it's another plot twist. Uh, I'm going to give you all the details here. The, but the twists keep coming. Um, uh, later we will see what the, the convention-shattering College of Ladies thinks of Epicene uh, in Act 3. Uh, we see what happens when it turns out that the supposed silent woman isn't the meek and mild maid that we thought she was. And we also see uh, Truitt conjuring up a duel between the foolish John Daw and the amorous, amorous Le, Sir Amorous Le Fou. Um, uh, and there's another big revelation that I haven't even mentioned yet, uh, uh, but I don't want to give it away. Uh, now, the Project Gutenberg text uh, does not include footnotes. There is a glossary of unfamiliar words towards the end, um, uh, but the glossary is not keyed to the text, so you can't really tell from reading the text where the glossary has that particular word. Um, so I recommend that if you're reading this, call up the, the text in one browser tab and call up the glossary in another browser tab so you don't lose your place when you're looking back and forth between them. Um, now, I hope that my intro to Act 1 and this sort of brief overview of Act 2 is enough to get you started. Uh, but I also hope by now you understand and appreciate the value of good scholarly annotations. And there just isn't a free online annotated version of uh, The Silent Woman. Uh, the Project Gutenberg text, it's pretty good, but it, it doesn't have the, uh, footnotes or, or, or mouse over hyperlinks. Um, I ended up spending about $9 uh, on the Kindle edition of uh, the New Mermaids edition of Epicene. It's got a good introduction, and it's got hyperlinks that uh, tell you where there's, you know, when, when uh, there's a definition or a comment on the, the phrase in the text. Uh, if you are interested in exploring these themes of gender and power in this play, I think the $9 uh, Kindle edition, uh, the, again, it's the New Mermaids edition, I think it's well worth the effort. It's not required uh, for, this, um, for this assignment, but anyway, I recommend it. All right, so... Uh, ben Jonson's Epicene or the Silent Woman, uh, very different from uh, the Shakespeare plays that we've looked at, but I think you'll see with the um, uh, idea of, uh, 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 of the, the character Morose might remind you of Malvolio, we have foolish knights who are fighting each other, we might think of Sir Andrew in, uh, uh, in uh, Twelfth Night, um, uh, we also have a more uh, tragic version of uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, roguish character uh, uh, provoking two competing lovers, uh, uh, rivals to a, to a duel. We've seen that in The Jew of Malta. And I think there are just many other connections. I mean, obviously, The Taming of the Shrew and Epicene of the Silent Woman have some overlaps as well. Um, so I encourage you to uh, get what you can out of uh, this particular play. And uh, again, if you are interested in getting more out of it, I, I would recommend that um, uh, New Mermaids edition. All right, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say uh, about, your, uh, about your first uh, exploration of, uh, uh, of this uh, Ben Johnson play.